go starting over <laughs> um i don't know those technical issues happen sometime they're very rare but but they do i guess it's the the blessing and the curse of uh of technology that's 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 my estimate <laughs> anyways anyway um, whenever, whenever that happens and it happens to my wife it's always on from my point of view pilot error and whenever it happens to me it's always gremlins <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, those gremlins. Those gremlins are nasty and and they are. <laughs> That's right. Um, I think. I mean, we've mentioned this on the last uh, sort of like go that didn't go well. I guess you know we we wasted a couple of minutes, but it's okay. Uh, we figured out what was happening. There was little technical issues on the on the software side that I managed to get fixed, and so that we're we're up live. So. Scott, like, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and yeah, let's let's get going. Let's uh, let's let's catch up. The last time you were here was, I believe, two thousand and sixteen. And yeah, it was two thousand sixteen. It was one of the the earliest one. I, I believe it was a uh, number ten or twelve. Um, and the time is flying. We just decided to catch up, see what's going on, and, and talk, you know, about the industry. Sure. Um, so just before we dive, you know, into deep waters and and talk about, you know, the, your experiences and everything, uh, let's maybe introduce yourself a little bit more. Um, I'll I'll do you do you a pleasure of giving the ground to you. I don't want to butcher butcher your um you know credentials i can butcher it myself exactly <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to take the blame for being the yeah let, the, let me let me butcher one. it <laughs> let me let me butcher it sounds good so um i i i started in the visual effects industry um sort of unofficially in the late 1970s early 1980s when I was running a company called One Pass Film and Video in San Francisco, and it was sort of the preeminent video and film post-production and production company in the Bay Area at the time, and um, <clears throat> it was the advent of you know Harrys and Quantels and paint boxes and Dubners and you know, all of that ancient technology, which we really embraced back then. Uh, in fact, one of our biggest clients was Pacific Data Images, which Carl Rosendahl headed up and then later wound up becoming DreamWorks Animation. And, uh, you know, we had clients like Colossal, and every once in a while we would do things for Industrial Light and Magic. And then in the mid-1980s, I wound up being headhunted by Lucasfilm and being asked to join Industrial Light and Magic at first as its head of operations which was sort of funny because when I got there, nobody knew what that meant. At least, less lessly me, I didn't really know what it meant either. And when I got there, you know, the Lucasfilm was an interesting company back then, which was it was very very cloistered. So mm -hmm. there was a group of people in the Bay Area that were very actively involved in film and video and television, but Lucasfilm and to an extent Coppola as well. Uh, you know, they really kept their distance. So we we never knew any people that worked for ILM. We had heard stories, but we never they were never integrated into the San Francisco Bay Area community. And partly it was because that, I, you know, when I got there, I realized it was um, a situation where they were just so thankful that they had jobs in the film industry in the Bay Area that they didn't want to let anybody else in. So... Mm -hmm. When I got there, the organization was um, very cloistered and and very, in my opinion, very disorganized, and and it wasn't run at all like a business, and it and it had all kinds of problems, and so it was very soon thereafter I was able to reorganize things and and wound up becoming Industrial Light Magic's general manager, and it was at a time when. Um, most everything that was being done was being done photochemically. There were really no computers to speak of. We had a small little division of the company called Pixar. Um, and, <clears throat> and there were no personal computers. Um, 
there were some dumb terminals and, and it was hooked up to a mainframe, but everything was being done photochemically. And because I came from video post-production, where everything was done transputer-based digitally, um, I didn't quite understand why people were using optical printers and, 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 and the like. And so I, with the help of you know, some very smart people, much smarter people than I, helped usher in digital filmmaking um, into Industrial Light and Magic. And uh, I ran that company and then continued to move through the ranks of the company, of the organization, until I became the person in charge of almost all production and post-production operations at the company, including Skywalker and commercials and, and, you know, and Soundroid and Editroid, etc. But I had a, uh, an issue ultimately with the person who was the head of Lucasfilm, this fellow Doug Norby, and the two of us just couldn't see eye to eye. So I left the company in, in 1992 and wound up forming Digital Domain, having worked with Jim Cameron as a client at ILM when he did The Abyss and Terminator 2. Um, he and I hooked up and we brought in another person, Stan Winston, the character creature creator, and I was able to get financing from the IBM Corporation and we started Digital Domain. And because Jim was running his company and Stan was running his company, really the burden of forming the company and putting it together fell on my shoulders. And um, I ran that company for about 13 or so years and then sold the company um, in 2006 um, to uh, John uh, Texter and Michael Bay and have since really, you know, sort of sat on boards of directors, tried to get some of my movies made, um, had a brief stint in the VR world when I thought it was exciting, which I no longer do, and um, additionally, you know, do a bunch of consulting on a global basis. Also got involved with a fellow by the name of Andre Luis, who um, started this small group called Trojan Horse Was a Unicorn, so I became a partner in that in the second year and helped that become an international conference of what it's become today and um, I continue to do consulting around the world and try to speak out for the digital artist and the digital creator across multiple platforms because I think oftentimes they're taken advantage of and their lives become a living hell in many ways <laughs> so, because they were you know sort of the reason I was able to do what I was able to do in the industry I feel like it's payback time yeah um that's 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 well well put that's probably you know no matter how much research i would do i would probably not be able to give such a you know extensive history of yourself uh which kind of makes me makes me think like a lot of things you've done up until now you know looking back at your your history with ilm with digital domain all the work you've done so far it's like when you were basically on the top doing that, I was still in the diapers almost. <laughs> um, but it's kind of uh, it's 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 very interesting, you know. I've been we spoke we spoke about some of those topics before, um, but times are changing, and you know one of the one of the topics you actually touched upon, which is uh, the, the, you know content creators generally speaking, is something that that came to be bigger part of the industry uh, as of today than it was a couple of years ago when we when we spoke last time I think the, the 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 biggest part of what was going on inside of the industry back then was uh, looking at uh, you know VFX in general uh, I think we all remember the story of um, the life of Pi and Rhythm and Hughes when they were picking up the the Academy Award for the best visual effects of that year and shutting down the studio because of bankruptcy. Mm. Like how crazy, how crazy is that? Um, but you, you touched upon the topic that I think we could start with and it's really interesting, which is, you know, the vulnerability of artists uh, in this world. And I just want to hear more, more of your opinion about this because I'll, I'll tell you this, I, I was, I look at ArtStation and I'm talking from a perspective of artist, but also a business person. You know, I run Learn Squared, which is 
by itself it's a business it's a it's an online art school um and one of one of my findings over past i would say four years i've i've been doing that for four years with 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 like all my friends uh is is very is is this notion that artists are really bad at business and i really mean it you know <laughs> like most of most of them are not all of them there's there are few people that that we me as an artist but also as a business person talk with when it comes to like hey like let's do a class together come on board be become a teacher um there's very few people that a read the contract um b hire a lawyer you know those those are like the, the layers that in pretty much any other job if you can afford to actually do that you would do it right away because you want to sort of like protect yourself um very rarely that happens and um i'm just curious i i, I would want to know like what's what what are your experiences when it comes to you know uh seeing what's going on in the art industry um seeing how artists are basically not being um what's the what's the what's the right word for this rewarded Left for the, <laughs> i would say it's it, the the amount of creative work or how important creative work is in the world in general because like if you think about and 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 that applies to interpret entrepreneurs as well musicians all of that right not only artists as digital artists but you know that's the topic we're going to talk about but there is a there is a huge underappreciation when it comes to like how important that kind of work is like i mean w world without art would be boring um so i would be curious to you know to hear your experiences about that well first let's start ta to talk about i think what the root cause of the problem is and particularly in the film and television and gaming world and particularly digital artists so why is it that this is allowed to happen and let's go even further back. Why are these people this way? So, you know, it's the whole concept of right brain and left brain. Mm -hmm. And most artists are right brain people. And, and as a result, have the ability to make those creative leaps. And they don't think, you know, necessarily strategically or in, in, in a hierarchy of order. They're, they have flights of creativity. And, and it's, I think it's just basic neuroplasticity is the way that people's brains are wired. Um, and now it, it gets exacerbated by the fact that there's such a desperate desire for artists and creative people <clears throat> to be able to get a job and to make a living. And there's this, I think there's this um, sort of overall joke that's played on artists which is, you know, the old, I'll use the old George Lucas line, if you give them enough pizza and beer, they'll do anything. <laughs> um, and, and I think that, you know, it's like, uh, it still shocks me that you would have a digital artist who winds up doing four years of school or whatever, goes into all of this debt, and then will do anything to get a job at any one of these major companies, and then will spend the first two years of their life you know, raising Spider-Man's eyebrow. And <laughs> even though they have, you know, $200,000 in college debt, and, and then they're excited as hell, and they're working, you know, 18 hours a day, six at times, seven days a week, and they're not making very much money, but they got a credit on the movie that goes by in a nanosecond that their mother can't even see because it's listed with 400 other people on the same, you know, on the same screen. But there is something weird about those folks that are so desperate to work on some superhero movie that makes no sense whatsoever, that's making billions of dollars, of which they barely get compensated. Oftentimes their work amounts to nothing because it winds up on the cutting room floor. And they give up their entire personal life to be able to do that. What is that about? And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that most of these people or many of these people are young and young people have a tendency to be able to put in all this effort and energy 
um, and are excited about the possibility of working at Pixar or Lucasfilm or Digital Domain or whatever, name your company or some silly superhero movie, and that at the end, they're excited because they've reached their, their life's goal only to find out that, you know, they haven't seen the light of day and they can't really pay for their car, um, let alone their food. So the, the industry keeps shoveling those people through that, through that process. You know, more and more young people are graduating from schools with that kind of, you know, that kind of debt. And more and more people around the world now have the opportunity to work at these companies around the world. And, um, you know, the older people, once you finally come to grips with the fact that, holy crap, I have kids, I got to put them in school, I'd love to have a house, I'd love to see my family, they're oftentimes, you know, replaced. Um, yeah. And they're replaced with that younger crop of people who are basically willing to do it for free. And then, you know, and you brought up, as we were talking a couple of minutes ago, offline, was what happens when AI comes into play. And when AI comes into play, that's the new cannon fodder of what these young people are doing. And so even they will now be displaced because it will be able to be, uh, artificial intelligence will be able to do a lot of the lower level jobs that these young people are now doing. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, um, we already have seen what software automation can do to the industry. I think the best examples are actually within the VFX industry itself. You know, things like rotoscoping, it's, it's, it's a prime mm -hmm. example where right now pretty much your regular Joe software can do a better job and faster job than really skilled rotoscope artists on, on a pretty professional level. I mean, mm -hmm. hell, like the software I just had a problem with starting the show, which is OB like I, I run the show uh, over at, uh, with OBS. Um, like OBS has a built-in keying, meaning if I put the green screen behind me, it will do pretty, it's not gonna be the best. It's gonna be like early 2000s, maybe like late 90s kind of, you know, rotoscoping, but it's a free software that does, does it automatically real time. And that's mm -hmm. a pretty old, it, it's not, it's, and by any stretch of, anima, uh, of uh, any stretch of imagination, it isn't like a, actual professional vfx software at all now we know resolve like davinci resolve i think has keying options uh after effects definitely has them there's a bunch of comp compositing software that doesn't cost much anymore but they do it do it automatically um yeah i had this discussion with ash last week we're talking about some of the research and it's primarily run by nvidia within the AI, like how it is changing the industry. It's kind of scary, but it brings back to the conclusion of how important creativity is. Because as you said, like the sort of the, the job that you can do with repetition and learn and learn to do, even though some of some of that work has some kind of creativity in it, but it's it's under the veil of, of artist is getting is getting automated really, really quick. And I think you put it on the button. I, I, I really like what you said about, uh, you know, that's it's not, it's not, not only that you said it, but it's, it's just it's just truth that artists think differently than a per, uh, regular person. I was watching, um, I actually sent it to Ash, who was speaking about him. I, I've, um, it was Jordan P Peterson's panel about creativity and how creative people think versus how non-creative people think like it's just there's just genetical differences and the, the the brain function differences that you know that comes to that and the one quote that i really liked from from that whole panel was it was in relation to liberal people and conservative people but in terms of their characteristic traits uh which was liberals start companies conservatives conservatives run them because mm. liberal liberal aka creative people uh tend to be think laterally and have ideas and problem solving uh ability on the level of coming up with with new stuff right mm -hmm. but they don't have that gene to think about 
doing the work that actually takes to actually be business savvy and actually run the company and be managers, all that, all that stuff that is really important when you run a company, but also comes down to just being a business person. I, you know, this trend of working for free is, it's something I really hate, but like, I don't know how this can be solved. No. Well, there's a, there, there are a couple of issues. One is is that, and I, you know, to an extent, I sort of take the blame um, in a lot of ways. Which is when I when I was over at Industrial Light and Magic, there were titles, and the titles for you know we were making it up at the time. You know, our our computer graphics department, so to speak, was like five people. And then, you know, we did Terminator 2, or no, we did The Abyss, and there were like 14 people. And then mm -hmm. Terminator 2, and there were like 45 people or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and because we were a union shop, um, we needed to come up with titles as to who these people were. And so, you know, there was a technical director, and there was a, a compositor and an animator, and when I started Digital Domain, I decided that what we, how we, we would give a nomenclature of a digital artist, and we would call them Digital Artist 3, Digital Artist 2, and Digital Artist 1, one being the most senior, and that we would set pay scales based upon experience mm -hmm. and talent. And so you could move up from being a Digital Artist 3 to a Digital Artist 2, sometimes even skip to a Digital Artist 1. And because of those titles, a lot of people actually started to believe that they were, in fact, digital artists. And in fact, they weren't. Many of them weren't. Some of them were, obviously, yeah. you know, but many of them were not. What they were, were they were digital manufacturers, so that mm. they worked in a pipeline, and they were not these super creative, artistic people they were manufacturers. They they put carburetors on, and they added they added brakes, and they changed the tires, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, <clears throat> when you start to think of the really the artists, the really creative people, whether they're concept artists or you know animators or storytellers or whatever, those people will always have a place in the industry, and they'll always be highly sought after and they should be highly compensated. Um, the manufacturers, however, as we've seen a large portion of them go to countries that are no longer sort of first world or, or you know, high, uh, highly paid employees, they're going to where costs are much lower. Mm -hmm. And then as we see AI come into place, even those people will be replaced. So. The digital manufacturing part of the process is going to always look for the low-cost provider, which ultimately will be robotic. And then, but the creative people um, are the people that are going to continue to work because creativity drives the rest of us. Um, and um, then the question is, will those creative people be looked after, taken care of, and make, made sure that they're not taken advantage of? And that's where unions and guilds and, and the like need to come into play to be able to make sure that that the businesses are not taking advantage of those folks and in a capitalistic society that's what businesses do yeah i mean the profit is the almost the bottom like that's where all matters i mean it comes yeah like a lot of people used to a lot of people used to get really upset at like say um you know, the studios and say the studios being Warner Brothers and Fox and, and it's like they're taking advantage of us. Well, no, they're just trying to drive the highest quality um, possible at the lowest cost possible. That's correct. And that as long as you continue to allow yourself to be the lowest cost or lower the cost or bid against each other, they're just running their business. They're not they're not evil. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> It's not like a Scrooge McDuck sitting there. Saying, That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, and it's it's pretty important to to understand that. You know, I you've run businesses obviously on the scale that is for me in uh, unimaginable. I run like a small, you know, almost like a mom and pop shop <laughs> uh, when it comes to like the art industry itself. Um, 
But the reality is like when you run a business and you want to do something, like you want to create more content, most most uh, most people that start businesses, they, they do it because, not because like, oh, I'm going to make money. Like if you're doing it just to make money, the likelihood of business failing pretty soon is very high. That's very rarely happens that someone starts a business for the idea of making a ton of money and then they become really successful. That's so rare. That's so rare. I, I guess like it's it's almost like a lottery ticket if that happens. Um, well, well, I, I would agree with you in the in the creative or in the products business mm -hmm. that you're that you're probably right. Like Steve Jobs didn't didn't start Apple solely for the purpose of making money, yes. right? He he started Apple with Waz to be able to sort of change the world. Now it was also being able to make a lot of money, but that wasn't primary. But one of the problems in, in a capitalist society is that there is a whole industry whose only purpose is to make money. They actually offer no services, no products. They are there to make money. That's what their, that's what their intention is. And some of them are very, 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 very successful. Yeah, I guess I just it's not my expertise. I'm pretty sure a lot of there there are a lot, a, lot, a lot of services like that. I guess like the um the closest I can tell is are those pl like managing platform f platforms for content creators that promise you, "Oh, we're going to get you like extra viewers and promote your stuff." And it's like in reality it's like, "Oh, we're just going to take your profit and do nothing." You <laughs> know, like almost nothing. <laughs> there's there's almost nothing we we provide outside of just like making sure that you're listed on our website and then <laughs> that we maybe send a link uh, or have you know i guess there is there's always some kind of product to it I, i'm not gonna sp go on a limb and say that that's always the case because there's there are industries that i just have zero expert expertise about so i, I just i just would be would be a, a bad idea to talk about them for me specifically but you know talking strictly um, creative world, entertain whether it would be entertainment industry, content creation, that kind of stuff, uh, that, or even just like Silicon Valley. In in most cases, um, the people that start the, that that do the startups, start companies, they usually have a goal that's driven by a passion in some sort, right? And yeah. oftentimes happens that they also have a partner that is more business savvy. And very, very often it happens that that partner becomes the, the driving force of the company that leads to the, de the decisions that make the company look like, oh, they're greedy as hell. Um, but as you said, like in, in the film industry specifically as well, like the, the, the idea of what the studios are doing, they, they exist not, not, not only to make money, they want to make entertainment. That's, that's, that's what they do. Uh, but the bottom line is they, they want to make profit as well. They are businesses at the end of the day. And I think about it from my perspective as well, where when you run a business, you want to make money. You want to make as much money as possible. And you always find a way to focus, focus on that to do that for a simple reason. Like if you're not making money, and there's just so many layers when it comes to business. You know, when I, when I started uh, Learn Squirt, for instance, I was... A, dumb as hell <laughs> and some of the like not only me but also like uh, all the other uh co-creators of the of the platform we were just dumb and we made this like at the very start we just didn't know anything about the business and once once it came into taxes into fees payments you know payment processors like there's just so many layers of stuff that are, an average person isn't aware of that you quickly realize, oh, like you actually have to know business to do that. It's not like I just gonna create something, and then I can just, you know, set and forget. You can, I guess, do that on the personal level if you're like sole proprietor, and you create content and you sell it. That's that's one way of doing things. But once you introduce more people into the equation, then you become a business, and then the business rules apply to you. The t the, the taxing is completely different. Um, and so like, for instance, if you want to hire people, you have to have profit to do that because that becomes an immediate liability for you. You have to pay people to, to do the job. And I, obviously there's, I guess if you don't have to pay, you don't pay. 
You know, I, I sort of look at the analogy of like running a business is sort of like having a body, right? So you need a heart, you need a brain, but you also need blood and money is the blood of the business. And you can have a heart, like you really want to do great things and you're passionate about things. You could have a brain, i.e. you have great strategies and you have an understanding of the marketplace. But unless you have blood, you're dead. Yeah. And, and so many people don't understand. They, 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 they equate money with greed and greed with you know, bad stuff. And bad stuff is not what we artists are all about. And therefore, I have no... That's absolutely the wrong thing. You should understand that you need blood and you need to pump that blood. And through that, now you have a healthy body. So, you know, if you don't have the resources to pay your people fairly, if you don't have the resources to grow your business, to buy the equipment, to buy the software, to make mistakes, to fall down, and, and not be in a position that when you fall down, you're dead, but, you know, get up and do it again. Um, if you don't have the money and wherewithal to be able to do that, you're destined to fail. Yeah, it's true. That's true. Um yeah, I, I, it, it goes beyond me, like, why artists would want to work for free. And I guess it's, it's, it's just a lack of education. I actually want to ask you about, because um, I was thinking about not only, not only that we are just wired differently to think differently, but also, you know, when I look at the, 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 the shape of the industry in general and, and also, like, what's going on around it, you know, the, 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 one of the biggest part of our lives these days is social media, right? Mm -hmm. um, it just, since I guess 2007 was the year when, when Facebook launched and YouTube launched as well. Uh, I think Twitter was shortly after, Instagram was uh, 2012 or 11. All of that is basically a very short span, it's less than a decade. But social media just became a huge, if, if, if a huge part of our lives basically. Um, it has quite a huge influence in, in terms of how we live lives, how we behave. Um, and I've noticed that there's this, you know, it, it applies to myself as well. And I want to go back to this, uh, the stigma as well. You, you've mentioned just, just so that I don't, I don't forget. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of, and I'm a, it's, it's a fault of my own. I've done it. I've done it before as well, where, I would look at the influence of social media, how it influences me, and then think that it's it's way more important than it really is, and it would vastly affect my own business decisions when it comes to my well-being as an artist in general. Um, so, for instance, you know, when when artists come and ask someone who has an experience, like, what kind of portfolio should I do? in order to be as successful as possible as an artist, right? I want to have this creative life where I, I do the job that I love and, you know, and I'm happy with, with, with my work. I'm getting compensated fairly, uh, compensated for it fairly, all that kind of stuff. And oftentimes, quote, we would say, or people would experience would say, do the, the work, the kind of work that you love because you're going to get hired for it. But then there is a wrench that is getting thrown into it, which is the social media part and the likes and the, the comments and the, the appreciation uh, that you get from, and I guess the, the dopamine effect of, of seeing hundreds of likes under the picture. Um, but what happens almost every time or most of the time, the amount of likes don't really translate to what kind of work you're getting. I, 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 I would say almost never, very rarely, unless, unless you strike a chord with like really amazing design that also correlates or, or resonates with, with the audience, which is rare. But I, I find doing it myself where I would just create the kind of work that I would do because, oh, like, you know, that's what people would be interested with rather than what I would be interested with. I, I, and I've noticed it pretty quickly and I try to like steer away from that, but there's that 
idea is always somewhere in your head. It's it's almost like we're getting this engraved by just the fact that the social media is there and we we, we are interacting with it. I wonder what your so, thoughts so, about that. So I guess, I guess the question is, what what is it that this artist is looking for? So is the artist looking to win a popularity contest? Is the artist winning looking to fulfill his or her creative passions? Or is the artist looking to pay his, his or her rent? Right. So yeah. what 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 what's the end result? Well, if you're looking to win a popularity contest, um, let's assume for a second that um, you have a great job and you're working a lot and you have you're well known. And, um, you know, the work that you're doing is your own art. It's your own content. You might be interested in what those likes are. You need to get 10,000 likes. It might make you feel good. And you went, wow, that's pretty good because your other stuff is taken care of. So you need to prioritize what your stuff that needs to be taken care of is. If your major issue is, hey, I'm living in a van, I have no money, I can't eat, or I can't support my family, or you know any number of those financial woes, then maybe your number one concern should be, how do I get hired? And then in getting hired, it's what is the market looking for, and can I satisfy what the market is looking for to get me a job? If it's not that and it's like you have a job but you really need to express yourself creatively, then it's follow your passion. And if you really need that dopamine effect of a popularity contest, then you're going to go for likes. You know, there's a, there's a woman that um, I've sort of become friendly with out of uh, THU. And uh, it's interesting. I've never actually talked to her in person, but I have followed her online. Mm-hmm. And, and, this, and this woman... Basically, she's not an artist, but she, she winds up, interestingly enough, sort of selling her body online. So she takes all of these outrageously dark and gothic and, you know, disturbing sort of sexy pictures of herself. And, and my response, to, and she say, listen, I, I can't afford, I'm looking for a job, and my relationship with men aren't working on it. It's like, well, can't you see what you're doing? You're setting yourself up to be viewed as this kind of person and they're not paying for for those pictures you're putting uh, out there for free what did you expect and her response was it gives me self validation so i guess the question is what would you rather be self validated by this bizarre thing called social media or have a career and a family and work and you got to make that choice but i see a lot of younger folks that are very social media driven falling into that trap. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I guess there is a route that you could use social media and that self-validation if you decide to create, to, to if you decide that you become a product in a way, right? So you become a quote-unquote content creator you present yourself from the light you want to present yourself and then you are intelligent enough to actually build a personality around you that that basically makes people cling to what you do and interested how what what else is going to come out of you right as whether it's uh, art photo whatever that would be um, but there is a huge... Well, again, again, if you have you have to have your priorities. So if you're pri- like there's a woman named Molly Han who I've invited for to THU in the in the past. And one of the things that Molly Han was able to do, she's an artist, but she was able to build a brand around this thing called Buddha Doodles. But she had a plan to monetize that. Right. So she sells coffee cups and T shirts and greeting cards and et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, is it avatar business? No. But she <laughs> makes six figures and she enjoys her life. And she gets to do her content. And it didn't just happen like happenstance. You know, it's not going to happen that. She had a strategy. She felt yes. like given what it is that she could do, she could create a career path, a product line and content that people would want and pay for. Yeah, I guess like exactly that. You, you, you know, you put like right on the button where if you, if you decide to be a content creator, it's not just posting. That's not what it is. It you have to have a strategy, whether it's like merchandise, advertising, um, 
working with with other brands where you get paid for what you do uh which by the way by itself it can be abused like pretty pretty quickly if you're, if you're not a quote-unquote business savvy in a way like just having having an ability to have a regular conversation with a person that's not creative and understanding your worth uh, as a as an artist that's that's a business quality that i guess everyone should have um but it's really interesting what you said but i want to go back to the one one thing you said uh, a couple of minutes ago about sort of like the guilt you know and i have a question to you about that what, what what's what are your thoughts on this but i think it's going away i i, I think that 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 notion of the worth of artists might be might be wrong but or, or a notion of an artist monetizing their work and making money there was for longest time i remember and i've been in in the entertainment industry um for almost 20 years at this point um and there was always this kind of weird stigma coming and and mostly coming from from outside of the industry that you as an artist like you're selling out if you're making money or if you're asking for money in one sh one shape or another you know it's almost like you're like the, I the idea of having an idea and and delivering it is supposed to be free labor. I was I, I'm always curious, like wh what were your thought? Like, what's your thought about that? Like, what do you think that stems from? Yeah, I, I think it's a joke that's been it's a very serious joke that's been perpetrated by the ruling class and the people that that control sort of the economies, which is. If, if, if in a capitalistic society you have the ability to convince the worker to be able to do it for free, then um, think how great that is from the <laughs> perspective of the person making money. It's true. Right? It's and true. so, um, you know, it's, uh, and because, you know, in, in many ways, art and creativity is a very subjective form. Um, What's a great artist and what's not a great artist? I mean, for, for example, this might be sacrilege. For the life of me, I don't understand why Jackson Pollock actually ever, you know, sold a painting. It, you know, I, I just don't. I could do spin art just as good as Jackson Pollock's work <laughs> is. I don't get it, right? So because of that subjectivity, er, an, an artist is always sort of walking on coals as to, whether or not his or her art is meaningful or important or valuable or has value. And there's that hesitancy always, which in, in some ways is, you know, oftentimes at the core of what an artist is all about, you know, is, you know, the old line of what is the definition of art? Why do artists create art? Um, there's, their lives are so chaotic. They're looking to be able to organize their lives and the way they organize it is through their art form, right? So, you know, if you're, if you're a person who has that artistic sensibility and you're unsure about how your art is viewed in the world and from a financial perspective, you're not sure how you're going to make a living, there's, it's not a professional uh, tract like being a dentist or an accountant. You're always sort of walking on eggshells. What's good? What's not good? And, um, and, and I think the people that that manage the financial perspective, which are driving sort of bottom line profitability, they see that as an opportunity and a weakness to be able to allow them to take advantage of the artist. And until the artist stands up as a collective and says, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore, that's going to continue to happen. Yeah, you know, it made me think about the way our schools are constructed, basically. You know, if you think about it, it's in the, the the current system and there's there's some exceptions in the world but the current system is basically you sit for hours on end and listen to instructions and learn to follow the rules right mm -hmm. and then no one teaches you about how to make money either like that's that's a or what money is yeah or exactly or or had a parent. You're That'd in, be a good parent. They don't, they don't <laughs> teach you the important things in life. They teach you, you know, who won the war of 1812. <laughs> they teach you what you can now find on your on your phone which, and right. much faster than, than you would ever be able to. Uh, it's almost like the phone is sort of like this 
this vast your your iPhone, your Android, your smartphone in general, it's it's almost like a cybernetic cybernetic ex- like external extension of of humanity at this point. I think, I think I was uh, uh, hearing some something like ninety percent or eighty percent of people on Earth have access to to um, to phones basically or smartphones. I can't remember the exact number. I would have to look it up. But it was like a crazy, surprising number to me, which means like the the ability to uh, to have the access to the vast knowledge of you know, once you have access to internet, you have access to way more information than anyone ever had ever in the history of humankind in the history of humankind up until the smartphones smartphones came out and and the really scary part is they have access to all of the information of humankind they also now have that information of humankind so that that makes it even more difficult right so yes what's real and what's not yes that's true um wow i think i lost my train of thought here but Uh (laughs) um but it's yeah so so the schools are set up to basically make you make you obedient to the rules that you're supposed to work with but Mm -hmm. they omit the idea of just knowing anything about money and business and that's that's sort of like the scary part, and that, that might be an you know a part of the answer why um, why are we getting as an artist, but not only artists. I mean, I mean, other industries face the same dilemma as well, like the 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 inter like free internship, you know, like work for free, you get you'll, you'll get your exposure and and your you know experience, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> Well, again, it gets, it gets back to that concept of, you know, are the studios evil? And, and, and the answer is no, the studios are not evil. Now, I'm talking about the you know, people that make money, right? So their intention is to get the best work they can for the least amount of money. Now, it's the artist's problem. So the, no, one, no one's saying to the artist, um, you have to work for free. They're like, well, if you want this gig, you work for free. And the artist goes, okay, I'll work for free. Well, you know, you're, you're slicing your wrists. Now, so many artists will say, well, if I don't work for free or if I, I don't intern or if I don't get my foot in the door, how am I ever going to get a job? Well, yep, that's a problem. And so that needs to be solved. And again, the only way that I can see that being solved is sort of the apprentice program. And the only way I see that being solved is with a guild. Yeah, I think I think the unionized idea there's there's definitely something great about that. Um, I can tell because there is you know when I joined Film Union, and I I could tell right away that the way the business is operated within the you know if, when you are an artist that belongs to the union, the way you review that is different to to begin with, um, but also. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like being in the film union th- does not guarantee you you're gonna work. That's that's of like, course not. Get out. Get that idea out of out of the door because that's that's just that's just not how it is. I think that's a misconception that some people might have. Um, but it means that you know, just just even the idea, and uh, that's a question I have mm-hmm. that I hope you have an, like at least maybe an insight to. But just just a simple idea idea of having a credit for the work you've done, like forget about mo- money for a second, right? That's that's a completely different topic, which is so important, and we we're talking about it. But what baffles me is, especially in film industry, and I I cannot understand why it's that. If you're not in the film union, if you're not wor- working, if you're not unionized, and you have the right. It's basically a right. If you're working on the film, they'll put you in the credit. That's that's so, so like the the ways the rules been working, almost since the beginning of, of 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 Hollywood. I cannot understand if you're why artists that work on the show, from let's say VFX perspective, don't have that guarantee. 
it's not that it's not not happening you, you know when you look at the credits at the end of the film it's basically a wall of names and you cannot distinguish who's who <laughs> um and usually when it comes to like especially artists in vfx there's you know at least in the film union like when you look at the the credits of the artists that work uh from the union side they're like uh, itemized you'll see illustrators listed you'll see animators listed you will see that 3D modelers, uh, um, you know, production production designer, art directors, you know, assistants, drivers, catering, like like ho- ho- hotel staff, maids, like all of them, unionized, itemized, and credited, and then you you get the section for VFX, and outside of the main names, let's say a VFX supervisor, you know, VFX art director like the more important roles, then there is this huge basically block. It's almost like a tombstone <laughs> of like world, uh, like people who died in the war. And there is like digital artists and a huge list of names. And those could be like from different locations too, you know, like, and and not guaranteed at all, not guaranteed at all. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, what's the reasoning and where's the bottleneck and why? Because like, it's one thing to not pay someone and and find it as a business business decision, right? At least you can you can um, at least you can justify it by the by, by the profit. Like you want to make as much profit as possible, but credit? Like I, I don't understand that. Okay, so let me let me first of all. It's hard for me to be able to say put the money side apart because personally, you know, I'd rather have money than a credit. Any day, <laughs> yeah, but, of course, yeah. But I'm let's leave that alone for like a second. Let's just address the credit idea. situation. Yeah. So the reason, the reason, twofold. One is, from a studio's perspective, they want the least amount of names in a credit, and the reason they want that is because they want the most amount of showings in a movie theater in a day, Mm. right? So if you have two minutes of credits, I'm just making that up, Right. then the credits end, people come in, they clean the theater, and they're ready to go again. But if you have 20 minutes of credits, and you've just taken four or five showings a day down to four or three showings a day, so it's a box office discussion, which is you've limited the number of times you can show the movie by the amount of credit roll you have at the end of the that film. Sense. So it's a business decision from the, from, the, from the studio perspective. So once again, from the studio perspective, since they're driven by making money, um, their intention is to be able to make the most money that they possibly can. They're a business, right? Then you get to, so then you answered your own question, which was why is it Right, and the answer to that why is it is because there is a Teamsters union, there is an art directors union, there is an animation union, there is no visual effects union, and since there's no visual effects union, there is no way to be able to negotiate with a studio that's a signator to a contract that says, oh well, these are the qualification, the classifications that we're going to have and visual effects, and these are the people we're going to put in, and oh, by the way, you got to approve, you know, all of the people. So because there's no central part of negotiation, the studio comes to the point of, I want to put the least amount of people with the the quickest credit roll that I possibly can put in. That makes sense. I guess, like, one showing in one theater, now multiply it by hundreds of theaters and multiply it by a month. Thousands that's, that's, yeah, yeah, ta- or thousands. Yeah, it's like millions of dollars of, of, uh, maybe, of maybe revenue tens loss. of millions of dollars of mm. revenue loss, right? Of revenue loss for no, any, no additional costs, right? Yeah. So it's, exactly. it's, it's almost pure profit. <laughs> uh that's true that's true so what do you think it's it's the solution i mean i i guess the easiest way to say let me let me, let me flip let me flip this for a second because mm-hmm. you know i've obviously been in my you know it sounds like i'm very pro-union or pro-guild and to an extent i am i'm particularly pro-union and pro-guild when the business entity uh, or the the bosses are 
actually a viable money making business, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's I, I've I was against unions when I was running Digital Domain, and I would have been against unions, and I was against unions when I was running Industrial Light and Magic. We had a union there, but I, I thought unions really harmed us. And the reason being is is that if the company that is paying the union the the union wages and the un, un, union pension and welfare etc has no margins they're not making any money then a union actually winds up not only hurting the company but also winds up hurting the employee because ultimately the company goes out of business right. so if, if there is no profitability in the company that is the unionized company it's easier to support a non-union company than a union company because it's just cheaper. Right. right? Yeah, of course, of course. That makes but sense. when you go to companies that are making a lot of money, right, and, and that money is, is flowing to management and or flowing to shareholders and they're mistreating their employees, then I am very much in favor of a union or a guild because the the inequality of profitability and or compensation is not is 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 just unfair right mm-hmm. so you know uh, i know bernie sanders was fighting for higher wages for disney employees you know so here are these men and women working at disney at the disney theme parks who are making you know hardly any money they're living in their cars because they have to show up to work and they don't they can't afford to live anywhere near the park Meanwhile, Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, is making you know tens of millions of dollars a year. It's just not right, it's right? So right. here, the Disney company is making a fortune, but it's exploiting its workers, right? Now, if the Disney company was making no money, right, um, and and it was the fault of the Disney management, then the Disney management should be fired. But if it's the fault of the business model of the industry, which ha- is how it was in, and probably still how it is in visual effects, we, we at Digital Domain did everything we could within reason to be able to keep our doors open and be reasonable to our employees. That being said, we were not a union shop. And that being said, you know, when we first started the company, we, we, charged, uh, we, we uh, paid our employees a 50-hour work week, 40 hours of straight time, 10 hours of time and a half, but that was a flat, right? So was that incorrect? Well, I, I would have rather paid them time and a half and double time, you know, um, but at the time, we couldn't afford it. We would have been out of business. Yeah, I, I, one, of the, one of the sort of like relevations I had and I think we mentioned this on the last podcast was the the fact that, and I don't know how it is right now. I'm I'm, I'm hoping the it's changing, but I will I'll be hard pressed to that to to uh, to like admit that the, the the rate of changes is is dramatic. I would say probably not. Um, but you know, like when, for for instance, just to give you an example, like when I work with with on any of the film shows, what I work with production designer or uh, director and we're developing an idea whether it will be like a, the vi- visualization uh, or vis dev of the, of the how the set's gonna look like or vehicles or characters like you name it um, when we create when we when we work on that the union workers are paid daily basically right so there is a mm-hmm. budget of what what has to be done and how much how much time and then we work on it, and then whatever comes out in that time and then within the, that budget, that's what it is, right? And then if we if there is sure. a rewrite or we need to redesign something, production model, exactly. So if th- when that happens, that that then that happens. What I've learned, which was shocking to me, is that the VFX shops basically assign sign a deal. We're gonna do it for X, but then there's like no clause for. Or no clear distinction that hey, like you cannot just come in at the end and say we're redoing all the shots, and by the way, we're not paying you any extra. You know. Well, there's it's 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 even <clears throat> worse than that. There 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 are opportunities where there are things called change orders, where you know if 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 you know uh, you're doing a sky and the sky is a night sky and there are two moons in it 
And then all of a sudden, the client comes back and says, well, we're doing a dusk sky, and there are five moons in it. Um, the company could put in a change order, right? right. The problem is, with that is, is that because there are only six clients, soon to be five clients, and all those clients um, talk amongst themselves and have a vested interest in making sure that they control budgets, what will happen is if you go to a studio and say, well, you wanted five and it was in, in, a, in the work, it was two and, and it's going to cost more. Their response will be, hey, you know, if you do that, we'll just not work with you again. Not only will we not work with you, we're going to tell the guys at blah, 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 to not work with you as well. So, I mean, come on, man. And, and, and here's another interesting thing. I met with a union boss once and we were having a conversation and, you know, he could not get his head around the fact that when we were doing a visual effects film and the budget was $20 million, let's say, for visual effects, that the visual effects company wasn't making a fortune. He just couldn't get it. It's like, yeah, 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 I know. You, you do like the studios do. You know, $20 million, come on, you're making $5 million, right? $7 million, right? It's like, no, no, we lost a million too on that show come on, tell the truth. You know, we, we know what the movie industry is about. You guys always, and they, they just couldn't get their head around it. So the studios sort of feel the same way. And then there's that famous line, I guess it was back in the mid-1990s or late 1990s, where a studio executive said, if I don't put a visual effects company out of business while I'm doing a show, I'm not doing my job. Mm. That's sinister. And the numbers have become so astronomical now. You know, when you do something like the Avengers, I mean, who? I don't even can't even um, I can't even think about what that budget might be for visual effects. It's got to be sixty, seventy, eighty million dollars, right? In a, on a show like that, and if and if thirty to fifty percent of your budget, your overall budget on your film is visual effects, you're thinking people are making a fortune. Yeah. It's it's crazy. It's yeah. I mean, people think that because the budget is high, that means the profit is high. You know, correct. Mm -hmm. And that's that's just not a case. Budget can be astronomical, but the costs might the cost of doing business might be even even higher. Especially if there is no cap on, like you said, like oh, like you can come in and just do changes because right. And then there is also this underlying, um, you know structure that is not helping to make things better um i don't know how this can be fixed for for vfx i i, I guess you know um i mean the the idea of well, again, making... again the way it can be fixed you know i get back to organizing the way, and i've been a big uh, uh proponent of this over the years but can't seem to get any traction in the same way that I think there needs to be an international guild for visual effects workers and that have that guild speak for visual effects workers and make deals with studios as to what their credits are going to be and what their work is going to be and what their overtime is going to be, et cetera, et cetera. I also think there needs to be an international trade association representing visual effects studios that go to the studios and say Warner Brothers Sony, you know, Paramount, et cetera. This is the way this industry is going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And until those organizations take place, you know, we're going to continue to see a race to the bottom. Now, the good news is, is that what's happening now is, is almost it's an infusion of, uh, let's call it methadone for a heroin addiction. You know, people aren't addicted to heroin anymore. People aren't going out of business in the same way that they were in, you know, in the early 2000s to, you know, to the early 2010s. And the reason they're not is because of the advent of Netflix and Amazon and Apple. And so there's a whole lot more content being produced and a whole lot more right. visual effects. So the good news is people are working. Work right now. Right. Yeah. There's a lot more work today than there ever has been. That's true. That's true. But then again, it comes down to individual artists at the end of the day, I think, where, you know, the things we were discussing right now, they're more structural level <clears throat> on the highest level. And you would need probably more than one person to, to do it, you know, and one of more than 
more than vast majority of an average artist that might be listening to to this show might even undertake um i i was wondering what is your thoughts about what artists individually can do um to sort of like raise their stakes like just even even with the assumption that let's say nothing's going to change uh from the structural part it's very hard to change a monolith let's put it this way the things on the higher levels when it comes to studio work uh having union not having union those are almost like the realities you're getting thrown into as an artist and you have to sort of like figure out without guidance most of the time where to go what to do uh and how how to you know behave and and act your, act yourself so that you're you're not getting taken advan advantage of and forget about oh studios are evil or this company is evil oh this guy is a, is 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 an asshole i don't want to work like he's ab abusing whatever 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 those are those are the things that will happen in the world we're not we don't we don't live in the perfect world and that's like a higher level discussion as well like what could change that eventually but just looking at I your gotcha. So let, let, let me answer that. So uh, I think you know, in the movie industry, and probably like any other industry, but in the in the in the creative industry, is the the more important you are is based upon the the more important the 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 higher up you are in an organization. So clearly, the person who has the ability to um, land a client is probably the most important person in the studio or the people that have the ability. And I always used to say, like when I was at Digital Domain, you know, um, uh, Neil Jordan, for example, or Ron Howard didn't come to work at Digital Domain because I was its founder and CEO. It came to work at Digital Domain because I put Rob Legato, a visual effects supervisor, in front of them, and there was a Vulcan mind meld. And, and Neil Jordan or Ron Howard said, God, this guy totally gets who I am, and he he's really gets my creative flow, and I want to work with him. Mm -hmm. And so within any, any organization, there are a handful or 10 or 20 of those kinds of people. And the management of that company um, wants to, they're quite aware of the fact that they're really critical people within an organization. And as a result, They'll do most things within reason to be able to make that person happy, and that includes what their salary is, what their office looks like, what the projects that where they work on, but also the teams that are around them, right? So if you're, if you're a, an artist in a company like that, what you want to do is you want to be really, really good at, let's say, one thing where that visual effects supervisor, the person at the animation director, the person at the top says, if I'm going to put a team, I need Bob to be on my team, right? Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't do it without Bob. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, is to be a team player. Don't be a prima donna. <laughs> Even when you're at the top, you shouldn't be a prima donna, but definitely lose more and more of your prima donna attitude the lower down you get. So, you know, be a team player. Be excited about the team. Carry the team colors. You know, put your hand out to help people when they're in need. So the more you're liked within an organization and like, gosh, I really like working with Bob, and the more your skill set is is critical to the team leader that's the thing that will work best for you and then when you want to fight your battles you know based upon compensation or something like that you go to the team leader who's got the juice and you say hey listen rob you know i just had a brand, i just had a baby i i can't work 70 hours a week you know is there anything you could do to help me out and Rob will do whatever he can and within reason. And the management is going to hear much more loudly from Rob than they are going to hear from you. That's tr that's true. Yeah, having having a back, like I, I think there's there's almost like a like clothing layers, right? Like if you just wear outer outer shell and you go into the wild, obviously you're not going to get wet from the rain, but you're still going to get cold because you don't have any right. layering underneath. Um, and yeah, just you know, I've I've stressed it many times on 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 
any kind of podcast that I did where I was talking about what it is like to be working in the industry and what are the main main things you have to really care about and pay attention to and not having an ego or like unhealthy ego like having an ego I, I don't think it's a it's a bad thing in general having unhealthy ego is um and, and not acting like a prima donna especially in film film is such a small industry when it comes to like how many artists work in the industry outside of the vfx obviously because vfx is a completely different beast i, I don't have uh, as much of an experience working in the vfx so i cannot really tell i had never worked in the actual vfx studio uh on the side i did some freelance work with the, uh, the vfx but when you work in film, and, and whether we work in film, or even video games, um, the industry is pretty small. It's getting bigger and bigger by, by the year, but generally speaking, it's pretty small. So if you manage yourself to get that that label of being a prima donna, that's a really hard thing to get rid of over time. And like, as you said, like no one no one's going to wor- work with you. And then on top of that, like, if you're a like really likable person, as you said, like if you can work towards that to be someone who everyone wants to work with, then your relationship with a person that is higher than you, your your supervisor is going to be that much better. And their willingness to act on your behalf, let's put it this way, will be that much higher. You know, like if, if you have a lead artist or, or art, art director um that really like you they'll do way more for you than for someone who's who might be equally as good or maybe even better or even better or maybe even better yeah i mean because at the end of i'll give you a good example and i'll use names one of my favorite concept illustrating persons uh, artists in the world and i think he's he's probably the best is a guy by the name of crash mccreary you know crash mccreary's work at all Crash McCree? Hmm. Crash McCree. He, 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 I, he's like the Michelangelo of concept artists. I mean, I, I believe his work is stupendous. And for years, he worked at Stan Winston studio. You know, and, and Crash is also one of the most likable, most spiritual, kindest. He's just a pleasure to be around and to work with. And he, is, he comes up with great ideas, and he's a great illustrator, maybe you know, in the top five of all time, in my opinion. Mm. So for years, he worked at Stan Winston's studio, and he was always in the shadow of Stan Winston. You know, Stan Winston was a very big persona. You know, he, he walked onto the set, and he was, first of all, the name of his company was Stan Winston Studio, right? Yes. So <laughs> when you worked at Stan Winston Studio, you, you had to be aware of the fact that you were a cog in the wheel, Right now, right. maybe an important cog in the wheel, but you were a cog in the wheel because Stan was the star. Crash knew that really, really well, and Crash played that really, really well. And at some point, at one point, Crash decided that now it was for time for him to spread his wings, and he went out on his own, and he's a superstar now, right? But he understood the game. The game was when I'm working for Stan Winston at Stan Winston studio, I'm going to give him all of the runway, all of the limelight, all of the opportunity. And I'm here to make Stan Winston and Stan Winston studio look great. And crash did that better than anyone that I've ever seen. And then at some point you say, okay, I did that. I can't grow anymore. Time is up. Now I have to be on my own and now I'm the star. And he did that. So it's about understanding what your place is, taking advantage of it to the best that you can. And when you're ready to become that star, then become it. Yeah, I agree. And the importance of, of having connections and really making a, an impression is, um, is so important, especially in this industry. And, you know, th- there is something to be said that like, hey, if you do that, if you if you put yourself up there, um, and almost like quote unquote let yourself to be abused for for benefit of another, uh, yes, that can happen. Like th- that's I guess you have to do a right judgment call to know when to stop. Like wh- when it when this push you're doing towards being the best that can be uh, for a help 
of someone else's or organi organization, whether you're working for a smaller or larger studio, that's always important. That's a, sort of like the professional ground. And you never want to, you never want to lose that. Like you don't want to be a person that, oh, this guy was like super unprofessional. You know, he's an amazing artist, was working out great, but when it was not going his way, like he just was throwing a fit. Like if, you don't want to have that label either. Um, right. But like just having mm -hmm. an idea when to know that you need to make a change and whether it's because you're not finding yourself to be uh, satisfied with your working environment, you're not growing. Like there's many reasons for, for that to happen. Um, but I want to, I, I want to add one thing there too. You use the word abuse. You should never let yourself be abused right. ever. Yeah, of course. So, so crash never let himself be abused, right? Because, he wouldn't allow for that. But ab abuse is one thing. Now, to understand that you're not in the limelight, to understand that you're there that's in correct. the service of, that's one thing. But to be abused, no. Yeah. Don't I ever mean, listen. That's what I'm saying. Like, you, it's your response. Like, it's always going, going to be your personal responsibility to not put up with it and then quit gracefully. Let's put it this way. Um, yeah. I, you might you might agree or disagree with me on that, but I feel like if if you're in an unhealthy relationship, right, and you want to maintain sort of like the healthy life for yourself, whether this is this is your personal relationship or or if it's if it's a work related stuff, um, the way I look at it is like instead of trying to find grudges and and escalate already not ideal situation it's better just to to cut the cord and move on and focus on yourself there was a, there was a saying that i had uh that ha hung in my offices years ago and, and sometimes in my home and the line is is the fucking you're getting worth the fucking you're getting <laughs> and, and and you, ha you have to make that determination. You have to look at it and say, is this worth it, right? And if yeah. it's worth it, then shut the fuck up because it's your decision. If it's worth it, stop your complaining and just do it, right? And if it's not worth it, change it. Yeah. I never found anyone who's complaining to actually do anything about it, you know? It's usually the people that just like, as you said, they just shut, shut up and, and do it. Because talk is cheap, usually. Like, you can talk and oh, talk and, that's and the talk. Reason, that's the reason that why there's never been a guild or a union. There's all of these people. I remember what, you know, like, Visual Effects Soldier was doing, and there were all these people anonymously getting on websites and complaining about this one was screwing this one and this one, and they didn't even fully understand the, what was actually working. But when it came time to do something, you know, there were crickets. Yeah, yeah. That's usually what happens. Like, people like to talk and then... When it comes down to like actually making like making an action, it's like oh like uh, I don't know it's too hard <laughs> and all that. Um, well, listen, it's been a it's been a pretty amazing talk so far. I think we, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I did too. Uh, we might be running out of time a little bit, but I I still want to leave a little bit of time uh, to have a little QA. We've had quite a lot of people watching us live and asking questions in the meantime so if you Shoot. if you're okay with that we could just go through yeah, some please. of them uh cool let's see um do, 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 do. let's see what which which uh question would be i think we'll start with this one is there any vfx industry still in bay area or is everything or has everything shut down and moved to la that would be interesting. I think ILM is still in the Bay Area. Right, yeah, I think they are. I wonder yeah. if there are, there are any more. I actually don't know how many companies are here in LA, to be honest. I know MPC is here. Um, yeah, there aren't, there aren't that many in Los Angeles. Anymore. He's not working on film. I mean, most of, the, most of the companies are in Vancouver or London. Yeah, but that's, where the, that, that's, that's actually kind of interesting because that's where the most of the Hollywood films or like the production there is, is going to. It's kind of crazy. Like right. people think that, that films are made in Hollywood. They are not. By, by the way, Hollywood is not even where the studios are at. They are all in Burbank mostly. Right. 
Um, but films usually start here because like most producers, directors, production designers and, and staff lives here. But usually what mm -hmm. happens is that you're going to have first couple of weeks of the production here, maybe first two months or three, and then they find location and then they move the whole entire production there. A lot of but times... There, I'll, I'll throw a wrinkle in there. So conceptually, uh, oftentimes the, 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 because the studios are located in Los Angeles and they're generally the distribution and financing entities of those films. So films, you know, sort of germinate here in Los Angeles, right? Yes. And then once there's a green light, then they go to where the tax subsidy is, not necessarily the location, where the tax subsidy is. Yeah, so that's correct. where do they get the most money back from the government uh, in, in subsidies or in tax credits? And that's where they'll go and shoot. Yeah, that's correct. So like, that's why you have uh, shooting locations in Atlanta, in Baton Rouge. Hopefully less Baton so Rouge. now, but yeah. you know. <laughs> but like, it's just everywhere. Uh, a lot of that That's is right. like right, right, not in London per se, it's like outside of it actually. Um, it's like 40 minutes outside, I think they have the, the Pinewood Studios or something. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that, and it, it makes sense that the VFX studios like are there as well because it's just like aligns with the locations where the, where the production is as well. It's also, no, it's, it's truly, it's just a money issue. I mean, yeah. the truth of the matter is, is if, if Budapest gave the kinds of subsidies that, you know, Vancouver or Montreal or, or London or the UK gave, gave, you would have ginormous visual effects facilities in Budapest. Did they, did or they in do Kuala that a little Lumpen. bit? I mean, it wasn't, um, where was the Blade Runner made? It wasn't the Budapest? It might have been. So there, Budapest had tax subsidies. I just chose Budapest because it's been on my <laughs> mind lately. But, you know, if, if it was Pretoria and Pretoria, right. you know, wound the South African government said, we're going to give you back 70 cents on the dollar to, to shoot and post in, in, in South Africa, everybody moved to South Africa. Yeah, they would eventually All about build, the money. Build, build the infrastructure there on the sure. spot. <laughs> Uh, anything can happen for money. Um, do, you think, do you do you think uh, it's important to break into quote unquote break into the industry with the smaller companies like mobile games or hold out for a real deal if that's your goal? Uh, I think you. Um, it depends. It it really depends upon your skill set. I mean, if if you're a world class fill in the blank animator. Um, you'll get hired by a world-class animation company. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're realistic about what your skill set is and what your portfolio looks like, um, a job is a job is a job. And, um, you know, you need to get your foot in the industry and you need to start making money. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, there is an interesting question. Um... I'm not sure if it's true, but I've heard that it's expected to work over time for free in the United States. And I guess that would be related to VFX as well. Uh, for someone coming from Nordic countries, that sounds like an abuse. I would say yes. Uh, but that's true, right? Like how many times the VFX are basically asking people, but not asking, requiring people to stay longer just to get the work done. So there are labor laws in the United States, and the labor laws in the United States preclude people from working overtime um, without getting paid for it. So like in California, for example, I believe it's, um, I forget what the laws are now, but I think it's time and a half after 40, double time after 60 or something. And so there are, there are these labor laws. Now, that's not to say that people don't break the law. They break oh, they the do. <laughs> they do there are no labor laws that say that so in the UK they work people extraordinary hours and there are no penalties whatsoever in the United States if you're working for a big company um, chances are they'll follow the labor law because there's too much you know, um, opportunity for them to get sued but if you're working for a smaller company or a mom and pop I can imagine that they break those labor laws and they ask you to work over time without getting paid. Yeah, it's a matter of, I guess, 
again like finding the responsibility here as well like if you are working yourself to death and getting not co no compensation about it you have to think about the idea that the time you, you're spending towards a project that you might have like a little influence over um unless it's giving you uh, again it's a judgment call at the at, at the end of the day and i don't agree with working for free at all i think that's that's the worst thing you can do as an artist um there are numerous occasions where you'll be asked to work extra i know in film specifically as a union member if you're asked to work extra time they will pay you they have to there's like i, I have never heard about you know any union worker that would not get compensated or asked to work more without getting compensation for that that just never happens the, the production company and or the studio has signed a contract with the union there is signatory to the union contract and if yeah. they break that they'll get sued and or struck so um you know it gets back to that that crazy line that i said is the fucking you're getting worth the fucking you're getting <laughs> At the end of the day, it's the, it's the employee's decision, right? Yes. So if, if somebody says to you, hey, listen, buddy, you're going to work 80 hours a week. I'm going to pay you for 40 hours a week and shut up and you're lucky. You got to think about, well, is that something I'm willing to do? Am I willing to do that? And if, I, if you're willing to do it for whatever reason it is, you like the pizza and donuts you ser they serve, you think the project is fantastic because you can't wait to work on a superhero movie and have your name in the credits go by in a thousandth of a second, whatever it is, right? That's your decision. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's one part about working for free. And I want to make a, like, I'm probably going to make a separate, uh, either a podcast or maybe a video about it, uh, which I think there's a, there's very niche area in which doing something for someone for free will benefit you more in the long run, but it's only an area in which you're initiating um, the conversation. You're not being asked to do it. You're well, you might, you might, be, you might be asked to do it. It's, again, it's a strategic view of life, right? right? So if your strategic view of life, if you think, well, I'm going to go work for ABC company, and they have a thousand digital artists there. And I really would like to work with ABC company. And I think I have the right stuff. And I'm going to give myself three months to work as an intern for free because I have a hope that I'm going to be asked to be an employee. Then that's a strategic decision that the employee or intern makes as to you know, whether or not they're going to do it. Or there might be some artist that comes to you and says, hey, listen, I'm working on a private project. It's really cool. It's to benefit, you know, sort of pro-abortion. I'm making a PSA, you know, a pro-choice PSA, and I, I'd really like to do it. And you believe that that lines up with your politics, you might work for free, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's always the choice of the, of the worker. And... Um, and understand what the long-term strategy is for you for doing it. Because at the end of the day, there has to be some form of remuneration, whether it's money or karma or strategic growth. Just, just don't do it because of a hope. Yeah. It's, it's, I guess, yeah, it comes down to that quote all the time, your personal responsibility, but also like, just just being aware what's your worth and and when mm -hmm. you, you should apply to when you should apply that worth when when it really matters um i would say just from my personal i'll throw this in this is I, i've said i've said this before when you work on the film for the first time it's like you just you know, you're holding a god by the an ankle and like, oh my god, I'm flying with him to heaven. But what happens is that after a while, it's like, oh, his ankle kind of smells too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and sometimes we make mistakes. I remember back in yeah. the 1970s, I was, uh, I used to be a sound man in the beginning. And this guy came to me, I was working on a show and this guy came to me and said, hey, listen, I have, I'm a producer of a movie and um, I really like you, and I think you do really good work. I can, I'll tell you what, I'll fly you to Philadelphia, we'll put you up, we'll give you food, but I can't pay you. But we'll give you like one point in the movie. 
And I said, listen, I can't do that. Flat. I'm not going to, how long is it? And he said, oh, it's, you know, probably a month and a half or so. And I said, I, I can't do that. I can't just leave my life here in San Francisco and go to, to Philadelphia and like live in a, in a hotel room and just eat. And I just can't do it. And he said, okay, no, fa- no problem. It turned out the movie was Rocky. So, you know, sometimes you, you, you make choices and you kick yourself, yeah. but you got to strategically think about it. I had no idea Rocky was going to be the hit that it was, and I probably would have made a, a, a godly sum of money with one point on a movie like Rocky. But I thought to myself, I don't know if this is going to be a hit, and it's not in my control. I don't, I don't know, and I couldn't afford to do it. Hey, it brought you where you are right now, so. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Who knows what was your life? Do we have other questions? You? Uh, yeah, there's actually a few more, but I want to consolidate two questions and then we can wrap it up. Um, okay. I want to hear your thoughts on, on VR and AR because you've mentioned about, you know, dabbling a little bit in the VR industry uh, and you're not too excited about where it's going. Um, you know, I've been recently working uh, with uh, Magic Leap, which is an AR company. Obviously, I cannot say much about it. If I do, then I'll be probably have a repo team. Uh, knocking down my door and you know collecting my liver and and <laughs> who knows what what else um obviously nda laws but um yeah I'm, I'm curious about your opinion about like how vr or ar in your opinion is going to change industry or if you, even if you have any opinion on it right now so two distinct things ar and vr yeah. VR is living in a small box of a uh, thing around your head and not being able to see anything. And AR is living your life and being able to look through something that you see other things with, right? Yeah. So two distinct, very distinct things. I should give you full disclosure that I was actually asked by Roni Abovitz in 2011 to be the CEO of Magic Leap. And, um, and I turned him down. And the reason I turned him down is because I couldn't ever imagine living in Florida. <laughs> and... And as a result, wound up being on a board of advisors and actually have a bunch of shares in Magic Leap. And so I'm a big fan of Magic Leap and a big fan of Roni um, and, and the team. Um, and I look forward to, uh, you know, them being incredibly successful at one point. So on the VR side, there are lots of problems with VR. One of the biggest problems is um, who wants to wear a goddamn scuba mask? Uh, you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> just how it feels, man. It's exactly don't that. Do that. You know, I don't want to wear. I don't. I definitely don't want to wear a public scuba mask because I'm a little germaphobic, and the last thing I ever want to do is put something on my face that you know that that Wook has worn in the past. You know, if you know Wook Bilkus, he's a great engineer. But you know, you just there are certain people you just don't want to get that close to, and so um, you know, I I couldn't imagine putting a a public mask on my face, no matter how much they disinfected it. I have a hard time with bowling shoes, right? The second thing is, uh, who wants to be claustrophobic and put in this mask? I I don't want to do that. The third reason is, there's really no compelling content. You know, once I've seen a dinosaur or a dragon, or I've walked up to the ledge of a building, so they haven't figured out the content part of it yet Mm -hmm. that was compelling enough to allow me to put on that mask and feel claustrophobic for the five, three, seven, ten minutes that they want me to do it. So that's, that's the next one. The next one after that is there's no distribution model. So there's no way of, even if there was this content of a way of being able to discover this content and get involved with the content. So that's it. And finally, there's no path to monetization. Right. So VR, as I said, you know, we've been talking about VR now since 2000. Well, let's leave early stage VR out. But, you know, when did Oculus wind up? Was that 2012 or something like that? So here we are seven years later, even with the resources of Facebook and Mr. Zuckerberg. And Oculus is still a wet dream. So there's... There's no, there's no there there as far as you said. You can't make money. You don't know what the content is. I can't stand putting something on my face. And um, what's the real reason for it? And, and then finally, because of all of those issues, there's no budgets. That nobody is willing to spend the money. So if, in fact, we're used to seeing like Avatar and those kinds of worlds with the budgets that they have for creating visual effects at that, that state, um, 
who's going to give you that kind of money to create a, a three minute, seven minute, 10 minute piece on a, on a, on a Oculus or a Vive where the installed base is not that much to get excited about. There's no way to get the material, you know, so it, it's a, it's a non-starter as far as I'm concerned. VR, in my opinion, is a dead budgie and, and, um, I, I, I can't imagine it being successful. Now it's moved to A. I oh, wonder okay. where it goes. I, I, I'll be curious if there's any application of VR that, you know, I mean, right now, I guess with the application applications that are available, there is there's certain certainly an advantage of, of having a headset and let's say mm -hmm. doing sculpting with it. It's just the ability to work within that space uh, because let's just put it this way. Uh, the technology of the headset itself is advanced enough to actually benefit the artist at the moment to a certain degree, right? Uh, so, so sculpting would be a, a, a great uh, example. It's not ideal, let's put it this way, but it's it's already good enough for artists to use it in the on the daily basis for their work in the industry, making them faster, uh, more creative, and whatnot. I've I've seen artists working uh, in VR. And it's just like the fidelity right. of, of creation is so much better than the flat screen. But I do agree well, with you. Let me, so let me, put my, let me put my business hat on and say, and so how many sculptors do you know that there are in the world that A, are sculptors that could issue. use it? <laughs> and B, and how many can afford it? And, you know, it's like there's no business model. So, yes. yeah, it's cool. There's a, some cool, you know, and, and if I was a hardcore gamer and I had, you know, $2,000 to spend on it and I knew how to set it up, maybe, I just don't think there's a large enough user base to make it a viable business. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult for sure. Uh, I don't know how, how VR could scale. It's, it's just like, with, as you said, People are so so self-aware when it comes to like what they are willing to wear. Um, not all of them, but if you're if you're trying to invest into having a, an experience with with VR, that means you're investing money that you potentially have. Um, that means you, at least to a certain degree, care about what you wear, you know. And yeah. with just the enclosure of not being able to see anything around you, that just limits you to to basically being in one spot and then there is another issue that um that is really difficult for me to digest when when i'm wearing vr goggles is anytime i'm in the headset which means i'm not seeing anything but the world that is presented uh in on the screen if that world is moving relative to my current position i get nauseous like right away it's just fucks with my brain basically <laughs> You know what I mean, and I don't know how they're gonna sol solve that. It's it's a really difficult... even if they solved it, e even if they solved it. I, I mean, it's just somebody should just say, you know what, it was like three D televisions or three D movies. It's done. It's dead. It's over. Get get out. Don't do anything with it because I don't see an advantage to it. Mm. Let's move to AR. AR. On the other hand, I think has great opportunities. Um, I don't believe it necessarily is in the entertainment realm, you know, um, but then again, I'm a 68 year old guy. So the concept of being a blorp and a blip and shooting at some Star Wars character while I'm sitting in my living room, I have no interest in that whatsoever. I, I just don't get it, you know. That being said, you know, maybe 15 year old kids get it and maybe, you know, 40 year old nerds get it. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't get it. So, um, but where there are incredible business applications are in training. So the opportunity to, to, to fix a jet engine, to work on, a, on an automobile, to do complex computing, to look at gene therapy, you know, those kinds of things, I think there's a really big market for it. Um, I'm not sure the video game, maybe there is, I, I don't know. Um, but it solves, there are a lot of problems that it can solve in terms of instructional education, um, the ability to be able to look at apartments and see where furniture is, construction, architecture. I can see applications across multiple fields 
And, you know, once they get the form factor right, which they will, I believe, get the form factor right, you know, I don't have to look like some cyberpunk guy with some crazy glasses on my head. And, um, and, and I, I can see a future in it. I mean, even if, even if you look at the, the set that's been released uh, from Magic Leap, I think it was last year, that was like the uh, developer set. So like you can actually go and buy and, and test it out. There's, there's a bunch of games that you can play, a bunch of applications. It's pretty cool. I've tested it myself. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, there, are other, there are other companies as well. I think HoloLens is, uh, is the closest, I would sure. say. Um, and Apple is secretly working on it in a very big way as well. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they, they, they are. So there's definitely a, you know, there is definitely a competition in there that, that, is, that it's growing. But I agree with you on this. I, I think, you know, just, just even having that very short experience with the headset that I had uh, was just amazing, like just blew me away. Um, right compared to anything that is already available in VR so so that's that's definitely a big part and obviously you know I work right now with with the guys over at Magic Leap so you know I'm trying to be cautious not to say too much obviously <laughs> well yeah but uh, you know the concept of like Roni's concept of the spatial computing sort of I can see the vision of how that might work and how that might be important in the future yeah I agree. All right, let's. I think we can wrap it up here. Uh, it's been an amazing, Pleasure. amazing conversation. Thanks a lot for for hopping on the show with me. Uh, we had some technical difficulties at the start, but we eradicated them pretty quickly, so uh, everything worked out at the end. Um, cool. A lot of fun. Thanks. 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 Scott. My that best was, to you. That was amazing. Hope to see you soon. Thanks for everyone Bye. who joined the show. And um, yeah, I'll probably next week. I'm I'm going to do uh, AMA. I'll post about it on the social media very soon so you guys can ask questions. For anyone who wants to have a guaranteed answer, just uh, go on the Patreon that I have for this show. I'm thinking about doing uh, dedicated AMAs for the show uh, monthly. So it, just in case you miss questions uh, during the during the regular podcast that we already have, um, I'm going to try to answer those that I missed or, you know, give you more give you guys more opportunity to to have an ability to talk with me and whatnot but anyways thanks for joining the joining this live as well as uh anyone who's listening to it later uh on the podcast forum where i am <laughs> available on uh, itunes google play stitcher um spotify and SoundCloud, I believe there, there, there might be more, but, but those are the major platforms and obviously YouTube. So, uh, thanks again, guys. Uh, I will see you next time and, uh, have a wonderful day, evening, morning, wherever you are. And till the next time, peace. Ciao.